we start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is Sunday, July 1, 2012. It happens to be the Feast of the Most Precious Blood of our Lord, and it also happens to be the 10th anniversary of my first communion and uh, confirmation in the Catholic Church, along with my daughter Lucy. So I'm very proud and pleased to be standing here, still a member of the Catholic Church, and uh, giving this uh, little talk. Um, this is going to be a repeat of a session we had a little bit earlier, but we had a video uh, malfunction, and so I'm going to repeat the talk that we already have an audio tape of, and we'll see how that goes. And you can compare whether uh, we, they make two different versions. Hopefully they'll be basically the same. The topic today is St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, part one. Uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch is the second earliest of the apostolic fathers that we have that have come down to us. Uh, last uh, time we talked about St. Clement of Rome. St. Ignatius of Antioch, though, is the second earliest uh, that we have. St. Ignatius was a bishop of Antioch. Uh, he was martyred in Rome around the year uh, 110 AD, and we have seven epistles that he wrote on his way to uh, martyrdom. According to Eusebius, the 4th century church historian, St. Ignatius was the third bishop of Antioch. The first bishop was Peter, St. Peter, uh, and, and the second was a man named Evodius, and the third man, according to, Ignatius, to Eusebius, was Ignatius. Now, Peter was the first bishop of Antioch. If you recall, in the Acts of the Apostle, uh, the, the Acts say that the uh, disciples were first called Christians in the town of Antioch. Uh, we have a, in the Roman traditional calendar, there's a feast day called the Chair of St. Peter in Antioch that celebrates his, his being the first bishop of Antioch. Um, and Antioch was, at the time, the one of the three largest cities in the world. If you recall from earlier talks, uh, it was one of the two cities founded by the generals of Alexander. Uh, Alexandria in Egypt and Antioch in Syria were founded as a result of Alexander's conquest, and his general founded these new towns, and they quickly became the one, some, two of the largest towns in the world. And when we continue about going into the fall, we'll hear much more about Antioch. It was a very important city, uh, both politically, economically, and religiously for the uh, growing Christian religion. Um, we don't know much about St. Ignatius himself. Uh, what we have are these seven epistles. Uh, there are later legends and stories about him, but those are pretty much everyone agrees came many centuries after his death, uh, as we discussed a lot at, for early Christianity and early and ancient documents. We often have very little evidence uh, about these people. Uh, but St. Uh, Saint Ignatius, what we have are his letters, uh, the seven letters we'll talk about today. Um, he has seven epistles. And why was he writing these? He was writing them because he was had been convicted uh, and sentenced to death uh, for crimes we don't know exactly what, probably having something to do with his Christian religion. And he was being escorted by a troop of 10 Roman soldiers to his death. He was being escorted from Antioch through Asia Minor, ultimately to Greece, to be taken to Rome, uh, to be uh, put to death in the Flavian Amphitheater, what we call today the Colosseum. Uh, in those days, one of the chief entertainments uh, in Roman, large Roman towns and in Rome itself was the, uh, to go to the Colosseum and uh, the, the spectators would see gladiators fight uh, to the death, uh, and they would also see various convicts uh, put in there to be to fight with lions and tigers and bears and be eaten up uh, by the animals to the amusement of the crowd. Uh, and there was a need for supplying the Colosseum with these convicts, so St. Ignatius was the one who was caught up in this and was being transported to Rome for that purpose and was being put to death uh, as, as, because he had been Bishop of Antioch. Uh, the first Four letters we have were written from Smyrna, and what had happened was uh, St. Ignatius had been escorted in chains from Antioch to Smyrna, 
and he was staying in Smyrna for a while with his guard, and prominent Christians came to Smyrna to visit him. They, they were aware of his arrest and aware that he was being escorted to Rome. And he was a beloved figure and, 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 a, and a major figure in the early church in Asia Minor. So he, he, he talked and met with Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, the, a young man at the time, and we'll later study Polycarp's epistle and his martyrdom. Uh, but also delegations were sent from other churches, uh, uh, Ephesus and some other places. They sent delegates, including their bishops and their priests and their deacons, came to visit Ignatius. And he wrote letters to these various churches so that these delegates could take it back to the local churches and they could be read uh, for instruction to the people uh, so they could know about Ignatius and, and what he was what he was teaching and, and what he was doing. Um, he is one of the earliest martyrs that come down to us. We know St. Stephen and St. James from the New Testament, uh, but uh, Ignatius uh, is, is perhaps the third or fourth that we really know by name. He's one of the most famous martyrs. He is in the uh, Roman Mass, the, the, the Latin Missal, and the Novus Quoque Peccatoribus, and the priest strikes his breath, breast. He, uh, he mentions the names of various martyrs, uh, and among them is Ignatius of Antioch. Um, I have a chart handout uh, here, and uh, I've got the chart up here in the handout. I think it's I think it's chart number seven. Uh, and as we go through these letters, uh, and as part of our study of the Apostolic Fathers, we're going to be reading them carefully to see what we can find on a historical basis as to the to the marks of the church and, and, and to the whether or not the marks of the Catholic Church can be found in the earliest writings that have come down to us. And so we'll be looking at things like the apostolic succession of bishops, presbyters, and deacons. Presbyters is the word for priest. Bishops, the Greek word is episcopus, episcopoi. Uh, but that's, those are the three orders. We'll be looking at the Eucharist. Uh, we'll find Ignatius has the first, first use that's come down to us of the word Eucharist and the Mass, and the sacrifice of the Mass and the real presence. We'll be examining St. Ignatius' teaching on the necessity of faith and works, uh, that those aren't in opposition. Scripture and tradition, that those are not in opposition. We'll see early creeds in, in St. Ignatius. Uh, he will teach that Christ is God and man. Uh, he'll speak of the Virgin Mary, the passion, the, the, the real suffering of, of our Lord uh, against an early heresy called docetism, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then we'll come to the Roman primacy, and the Roman teaching authority, and also we'll have the first use in these letters of the term Catholic Church uh, that we'll see uh, in these letters. Now, um, as to Ignatius himself, it's not clear, he was the third bishop of Antioch, and there's a good chance that he knew Peter, uh, and perhaps knew John, who was, uh, tradition says, uh, lived to an old age in Ephesus, uh, and perhaps Paul, who also came through those cities, well, we have no direct evidence of that, and there's some indication that he might have been a late convert. So it's possible that he may not have directly interacted with those apostles. We don't know for sure. He doesn't mention it directly in his letters. But there's no question that the people he's writing to, uh, that the audience of these letters, those people were in direct communication with the apostles. St. Polycarp, for instance, was instructed personally by St. John. Uh, we know that from other documents that we'll see. Uh, and there's no question that many of the people he was writing to would have had, would have had direct communication with Peter and Paul, uh, and perhaps even with our Lord. So it's one of the guarantees of the, the accuracy of these as, as statements of, of what the early church believed. Because if Ignatius is writing these things to eyewitnesses, to people who actually are in communication with the apostles, it's, it's a strong guarantee that what he's saying is what these people were actually talking about, what they've been taught by the apostles. Um, how do we know these letters are authentic? Uh, one of the issues with ancient documents is, is how do you know you've got the really, these are really the old documents? Uh, we don't have the manuscripts that Ignatius actually wrote or dictated to, to scribes. Uh, with any ancient documents, they, they, get, they get copied and numerous times, the, the documents fall apart, they rot away, they get burned up in fires, they get lost. Uh, and so this is not an odd thing. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, the earliest manuscript we have, is from like the 11th century. 
and it's a copy of a copy which itself was copied previously many times until you get back to the original. So how do we know that these things are original, uh, are, are, are authentic, uh, let us Ignatius? Um, for a long time, that issue didn't need to be decided. Uh, when the Protestant Reformation broke out, and Protestants started saying things like, well, faith is an opposite of works, and you have to have sola scriptura, and you can't have tradition. And some Protestant groups started to say, you don't need bishops or priests, and the apostolic succession is not important. It, people started to look into what the early church believed, because the Protestants and the Reformation were saying, oh no, the early church didn't believe in these Catholic things. That was an invention later of the Catholic Church. And so scholars, the scholarship in its infancy started reading these letters and reading documents and going to libraries and looking at old manuscripts. Um, there was a problem. Uh, there were various versions of the Ignatian epistles uh, floating around, uh, and there's what's called the Long Recension. Uh, it turns out that we discovered that some two or three or four centuries after Ignatius' death, uh, someone uh, wrote uh, more letters, and they're spurious letters. They wrote, the writer pretended to be Ignatius and wrote some additional letters. And also people wrote Acts of his martyrdom, the stories about what he did you know, in the arena. I think that some of, one of the acts even has him engaged in a dialogue, a philosophical debate with the Emperor Trajan. All of these documents were much later. They're not, they're not from Ignatius' time. Uh, and it shouldn't be shocking because in the, in the ancient world, it was not unusual for people to take an earlier writing and then add to it. And add, add, add uh, uh, they would write more things and they would make up fic fictional dialogues. And these were done largely out of pious motives. People would try to say, well, what would St. Ignatius have said to Trajan had he been there? And he would write up this dialogue. And it, would, it, was, not, it was not clearly marked as this is a, a historical fiction. Uh, I mean, today we have historical fictions uh, that you, you can buy and, and read. And there's no question that this is a fictional treatment of what actually happens, not a historical document. There was no such distinction in the ancient world. So you had these, these things floating around. And what happened is, is when these, in the Protestant Reformation, when these issues came up, um, the Catholic Church seized upon the letters of Ignatius and said, look, these things are the early church. And what the Protestants did is they seized upon them and said, they're all forgeries. Uh, they're, they're fictitious, none of them are correct. Well, the science uh, of studying ancient manuscripts, uh, uh, the science of, of, of interpreting uh, old documents and determining what are, what's authentic and what's not was in its infancy, but it developed. And as it developed, scholars got better and better at, at discerning uh, what was real, authentic, and what was not. And more manuscripts came to light, earlier manuscripts. And this is a long way of saying, we get to, to the handout I have here. It's a translation in English by a man named J.B. Lightfoot. In the 19th century, J.B. Lightfoot uh, wrote this translation but he was one of the great patristic scholars, scholars of the uh, early church fathers uh, that were in England in the 19th century. Uh, Blessed John Henry Newman was another. And these men devoted their lives to studying the ancient documents. And J.B. Lightfoot was a, a, a man of the Church of England. He was a professor of divinity for many years at the University of Cambridge. He was fluent in Latin and Greek and Syriac Coptic and Arabic and a bunch of modern languages, which you have to be to be able to do this sort of thing. Um, and he actually became Bishop of Durham uh, in the Church of England. He was the, the Anglican Church Bishop of Durham. And he's, he, he and the other people, English scholars, were trying to figure out what is the Catholic Church and what is the original document, document because they were trying to argue that the Church of England was part of the Catholic Church. Uh, John Henry Newman did this, and he wrote a book called Arians of the Fourth Century. He, too, got to delved deeply into patristics. Uh, and as a result, he came, became convinced that the Catholic Church was the real church, and he became a Catholic, and now he's been beatified. Uh, J.B. Lightfoot did not become a Catholic, but he was very, uh, in a sense, of communion with the Church of Rome, but he was very, uh, very uh, uh, friendly to, to, the, to those notions. But above all, he was a major scholar. 
And he wrote a five volume work called The Apostolic Fathers. And I have three volumes here today. Uh, this, these are three deal with Ignatius and Polycarp. And to the, the, these were most recently was published in 1890. And these are acknowledged today as being the definitive editions of these, of these works. And as a result of the scholarship of people like J.B. Lightfoot, to nowadays, nobody denies that these versions of the seven official epistles are the authentic letters of St. Ignatius. Catholic scholars believe that, and non-Catholic scholars of all persuasions believe that. Anybody who knows anything about the field uh, nowadays does not dispute that these uh, seven are, are the authentic. Uh, the, and there's no dispute also that the other, the long recensions, the editions, the purities are not authentic. Uh, it used to be Catholics would stand up and say, oh no, they're all authentic. As a result of this kind of scholarship, uh, there's now consensus among just every, everybody, any scholarly uh, background, uh, that these are authentic letters. And, and, and this, this book is, he has the Syriac versions from ancient, ancient Syriac versions. He has ancient Coptic versions. He has ancient, even Arabic extracts of, of St. Ignatius. Uh, it just shows the depth of the scholarship. Well, with that, let me move to the letters themselves. Um, we'll start with the epistles uh, to the Ephesians. Um, in this letter, he's in Smyrna. He's with Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna, and these delegations have come, and he writes this to, uh, he says, Ignatius, who is also a Theophorus, under her which has been blessed in greatness to the plenitude of God the Father. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, which is in Ephesus of Asia. And he says, I was on my way from Syria in bonds for the sake of the common name and hope, and was hoping through your prayers to succeed in fighting with wild beasts in Rome. So he's in, embracing his, his, his trip to martyrdom. Uh, uh, he says, I received your whole multitude in the person of Onesimus, whose love passes utterance and who is moreover your bishop in the flesh. And I pray that ye may love him according to, to Jesus Christ and that you may all be like him. He also says, uh, uh, your fellow servant, uh, Burrus, who by the will of God is your deacon. So he has a deacon and the bishop from the church of Ephesus who's there meeting him. He's giving them this letter. Uh, in section two, he, he, he ends it by saying, it's therefore meet for you in every way to glorify Jesus Christ, to glorify you, that being perfectly joined together in one submission, submission, submitting yourselves to your bishop and presbytery, you may be sanctified in all things. He, here the Greek word bishop is episcopus, we've talked about. Uh, in, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, uh, Peter talks about Christ being, Jesus Christ being the, epis the episcopus, the bishop of our souls. And, and this is an early, uh, a word in the early church, means overseer, and we, it is what we call a bishop. And the presbytery uh, is the group of priests, the group of presbyters in the early church. So you have a bishop and the presbytery gathered around the bishop. Uh, this word appears in the New Testament in Timothy 4.14. There's a reference to the uh, presbytery there. Um, moving on to paragraph 3, towards the end, he says, But since love does not suffer me to be silent concerning you, therefore as I forward to exhort you that you may in harmony with the mind of God. For Jesus Christ also, our inseparable life, is in the mind of the Father, even as the bishops that are settled in the farthest parts of the earth are in the mind of Jesus Christ. And this is, this is, again, a reference to the importance of bishops. Um, and, and, and the, the, the quote from 1 Peter that I mentioned, uh, 225, he says, and Peter says, For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and episcopus, bishop of your soul, meaning Jesus Christ. In section 4, there's, there's, there's a, a sentence that says, for your honorable, honorable presbytery, which is worthy of God, is attuned to the bishop, even as it strings to a lyre. So we have a lyre as a musical instrument, not a lyre. <laughs> but uh, here we have a bishop in the presbytery, and the importance of this of a single bishop with a priest gathered about him. In paragraph 5 is an interesting statement. He says, if anyone be not within the precinct of the altar, he lacketh the bread of God. And the Greek word for for Precinct of the altar here is Thusiasterios, easy for me to say, the place of sacrifice. Uh, in other words, it's a sacrificial altar. So when we talk about the altar that these, the bishop and the uh, presbyters are, are, are 
offering the Mass on, we're talking about a sacrificial offer, not just a memorial here. And this is important because um, the Protestants, uh, the Protestant Reformation would say that the, there is no sacrifice, that, the, that the, uh, the Eucharist, the communion service is simply a memorial. And here's one evidence of an early indication that the early church viewed it as an altar and as a sacrifice. And we'll see more of that as we go through here. Um, in section six, he says, plainly, therefore, we ought to regard the bishop as the Lord himself. Another reference to the importance of the bishop. In paragraph seven, there's a snippet that really constitutes an early creed. He says, there is only one physician of flesh and of spirit, generate and ingenerate, God and man, true life and death, son of Mary and son of God, first passable and then impassable, Jesus Christ our Lord. And here he's talking about the, the, the core part of the teaching that, it, that Jesus Christ is both God and man. Uh, he says it explicitly, uh, and he also says he's, he's passable and impassable. Well, passable uh, passions had to do with suffering. And what he's saying here is he's, he's, he's capable of suffering in his humanity, and he's impassable because he's God, he doesn't suffer, but he does both. And this is a, an early reference to the two natures of Christ, uh, very early in, in Christianity. Um, and we'll come back to that in just a moment because it becomes very important here. Christ is God and man. Um, in section 9 of the epistle to the uh, Ephesians, he references evil doctrine because he's writing these letters in part to refute some heresies that have come up, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, in section 10, he says, um, pray for the rest of mankind, permit them to take lessons at least from your works. And here we have a reference to the importance of works uh, very early on. Uh, the Catholic teaching is that faith and works are both necessary, that they're complementary. During the Protestant Re Reformation, um, the Protestants came up with the phrase sola fide, faith alone, and they, 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 they basically taught that works was in opposition to faith, that if you did anything for works, that you were denying faith, and therefore you were departing from the uh, teaching of the early church and the teaching of our Lord and the Apostles. The Catholic doctrine has always been both of these go together, they're not in opposition, it's crazy to say that they're in opposition. Uh, and not only is it crazy, it's contrary to the teaching of the early church through St. Ignatius and the other people who were in contact with the apostles and the disciples of the Lord. It's very clearly throughout these, uh, these letters that we were reading and will read, faith and works are viewed as going hand in hand, not as something in opposition. Moving along in section 11 uh, of the, the epistle, uh, the last part says, let nothing glitter in your eyes apart from him in whom I carry about my bonds, my spiritual pearls, he's in chains, in which I would fain rise again through prayer, whereof may it be my lot to be always a partaker, that I may be found in the company of those Christians of Ephesus, who moreover were ever of one mind with the apostles in the power of Jesus Christ. And here he's clearly referring to, to the Christians of Ephesus, which include the apostle Paul, who, who uh, acted the book of Acts tells us Paul spent three years in Ephesus, and also John, who, who lived out his life in Ephesus according to tradition. Um, so he's referring to those apostles at this, at this church in Ephesus. He, he goes on in section 12 to say, Ye, the, the, the Ephesians, are associates in the mysteries with Paul, who was sanctified. Um, and this is a, uh, associates in the mysteries with Paul. Uh, this is an echo of Paul's letter to the Ephesians 6.19, where he, he exhorts people to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Uh, mysteries in Greek is another word uh, for, for sacraments. Uh, but to make known the mysteries of the gospel, it's interesting, when that letter to the Ephesians was written, there was, this was before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were even written down. So there were no written gospels. What he's talking about is make known the mysteries of the gospels is the message. As we've studied the, the Greek word for, for Gospel is Evangelion or Evangelion, which means the good news, the message that God, Jesus Christ, gave the apostles and commissioned them to transmit to their to, to the world and to their successors. Um, it, it's 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 the message, um, and here we have a Catholic teaching that, that in the Reformation 
the, the Protestant says, Sola Scriptura. We only go by Scripture. Well, when Paul wrote, Make Known the Mysteries of the Gospels, there was no Scripture. The Gospels didn't exist. And what we have here is a message that's being handed down by tradition. Tradition, in its Latin root, means to hand on something. And that's what we have. And once again, the Catholic teaching is that Scripture and tradition are, are, are together. They go hand in hand. The Protestants said, well, you have to have Sola Scriptura, and therefore we reject something that's in tradition. If we only find it in tradition, it, it's not biblical, and therefore we do not believe it. And the Catholic Church teaches that's crazy. Uh, they, there's no reason to put them in opposition. And moreover, if you study the Apostolic Fathers, you find that from the very earliest time, it's very clear that they go together, and that there are many things in tradition that may not be explicit in tradition, Scripture, to be sure, tradition can't contradict scripture, but they go together hand in glove, and tradition fills out the story of scripture and, 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 and explains it and it is a way to interpret scripture. And we see that in this in this letter. Uh, turning to the next page, we have at the end of section 14, he says, the tree is manifest from its fruit, so that they that profess to be Christ shall be seen through their actions their works. For the work is not a thing of profession now, but is seen then when one is found in the power of faith unto the end. In other words, you got to not only have faith, you got to have faith to go to the end and do the works. And once again, we have faith and works clearly in hand in hand. Uh, paragraph 17 refers to, for this cause, the Lord received ointment on, on his head. The word ointment is myrrh, uh, which calls to mind the anointing in Bethany, uh, mentioned by Matthew, Mark, and John. And John. Paragraph 18 is an important paragraph, an important section. He says, My spirit is made an offscoring for the cross, which is a stumbling block, the Greek word is scandal, a stumbling block, to them that are unbelievers, but to us salvation and life eternal. Where is the wise? Where is the disputer? Where is the boasting of them that are called Kudu? For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived in the womb by Mary according to a dispensation of the seed of David, but also of the Holy Ghost. And he was born and was baptized that by his passion he might cleanse the water. Here again, we have an early creed mentioning the two natures, uh, that he was of the seed of David, the womb of Mary, but also of the Holy Ghost. And here we have something that's very important. I mean, you may overlook it because we're so used to it. He says, for our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived, our God. Um, in current scholarship, current academics, major universities, there are a lot of people who will write things that you can read where they will assert something like the following. Um, the historical Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was a, a, an itinerant preacher who was a, a, had great wisdom and, 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 and said very nice things and went around teaching, but the idea that he was God was not something that existed at the time he preached and it was not known among the early church. The notion that Jesus Christ was also God, was divine, was something that was invented much later. And many of these scholars will point to the Emperor Constantine convening the uh, Council of Nicaea in the year 325, and they'll say, well, the emperor, the imperial government got together with these powerful bishops and they decided to proclaim the Nicene Creed and have a new thing, that is that Jesus is God of God. Jesus Christ is not only man, but God. And they did this so they could control uh, people and, and amass power and wealth, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's a, 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 that theory is out there, and it's, it's, it, if you look at all, you'll find it uh, very much that the early church didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, and something was created later uh, by the bad Catholics and the bad imperial government. Well, here, at this time, is an early refutation of this, because Ignatius, on his way to execution, says, for our God, Jesus the Christ, it's very clear that he views Christ as God and man, and that this is a teaching of the earliest fathers. And it's not a, a situation of he's, he's getting power, uh, Roman power, or, or the power of the church. He's being, the, the Roman power is, is taking him to his death, to be tortured to death in the Colosseum. And yet this man is proclaiming the early faith that Jesus is God. And th this is a direct refutation of the current so-called scholarship, which asserts that the notion that Christ was God was a late development. It was actually there from the very beginning. Um, now we come to section 19, which is uh, the most famous passage from Ignatius. 
It's the most cited passage, passage one of the most cited passages in the Fathers. Uh, it's astonishing for its beauty and moving eloquence, and, and it, it bears reading slowly. He says, and hidden from the prince of this world were the virginity of Mary and her child Mary, and likewise also the death of the Lord. Three mysteries to be cried aloud, the which were wrought in the silence of God. The silence of God. How then were they made manifest to the ages? A star shone forth in the heaven above all the stars, and its light was unutterable, and its strangeness caused amazement, and all the rest of the constellations with the sun and the moon formed themselves into a chorus about the star. But the star itself far outshone them all. And there was perplexity to know whence came this strange appearance, which was so unlikely. From that time forward, every sorcery and every spell was dissolved. The ignorance of wickedness vanished away. The ancient kingdom was pulled down when God appeared in the likeness of man. Jesus Christ, obviously, is the star, and he's explicitly God in the likeness of man. Unto newness of everlasting life. And that which had been perfected in the counsels of God began to take effect. Thence all things were perturbed because the abolishing of death was taken in hand. And of course he's talking to about what we mentioned in an earlier lecture about how the incarnation is the most astonishing event in all of history. All of history changes as a result of God being incarnate. And the early church is a historical matter. Whether you believe in the religion or not, there's no question that Ignatius and the early church believed that Jesus Christ was God in the very early, early stage. And this is astonishing that this man would be in chains on his way to death could write such magnificent uh, poetry here almost. And it's, and it's really a, a fantastic thing. Section 20, he says, if Jesus Christ should count me worthy through your prayer, and it should be your, the divine will. In my second track, which I tracked, Writing, which I intend to write to you, I will further set before you this dispensation. It's too bad uh, because he's talking about I'm going to write something else. How he could surpass what he's written, who can, who can tell? But as far as we know, we've never written. Um, at the end of section 20, he says, Assemble yourselves together in common, every one of you severally, man by man, in grace, in one faith, in one Jesus Christ, who after the flesh was of David's race, who is son of man and son of God to the end that ye may obey the bishop and the presbytery without distraction of mind, breaking one bread, which is the medicine of immortality, and the antidote that we should not die but live forever in Jesus Christ. And here's another obvious reference to the Eucharist, the breaking of one bread with the bishop and the presbyters in the apostolic succession. And he closes by, by sending a greetings from Polycarp, uh, the bishop of Smyrna. The second letter is to the Magnesians. Uh, he writes to the church in Magnesia, which is uh, another Asiatic church, and he talks about, uh, I was permitted to see you in the person of Damas, your godly bishop, and your worthy presbyters, those are priests, Bassus and Apollonius, and my fellow servant, the deacon, Zotion, of whom I would fain have joy for that he is subject to the bishop as under the grace of God and to the presbytery as under the law of Jesus Christ. And there you have the three words. He says, Yea, and it becometh you not also not to presume upon the youth of your bishop, but according to the power of God the Father to render unto him all reverence, even as I have learned that the holy presbyters also have not taken advantage of his outwardly youthful estate, but give place to him as one to one prudent in God, yet not to him, but to the Father of Jesus Christ, even to the bishop of all. And here's an interesting thing. Apparently, Damas, the bishop of Magnesia, was a young, young man, and he had presbyters, priests who were older than him. And he, but he's, he's saying you, you, it's appropriate because of his office, the fact that he's a bishop and a successor to the apostles, uh, and, and not even successor to the apostles, but successor to Jesus Christ, bishop of you all, that you should give reverence to him and to follow what he says. Section 4, he says, It is therefore meet that we not only be called Christians, and here's the use of the word Christians, as we know in Acts, the book of Acts 11 26, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Section 6, he says, I advise you, be zealous to do all things in godly concord, the bishop presiding after the likeness of God, and the presbyters after the likeness of the council of the apostles, with the deacons also who are most dear to me, 
having been entrusted with the diaconate of Jesus Christ, who were the Father before all before the worlds, and appeared at the end of time. And here we have the bishop presiding, the word for presiding uh, is based on the word cathedra, uh, which is the, the chair, the seat, uh, in Latin it's the sedis uh, of, the, of the bishop. And we'll talk about that in, in later lectures about the, the significance of the word cathedra. But here, very early, we have the bishop sitting on his presiding uh, on his cathedra. And we have the phrase before the worlds, and of course in the liturgy we have uh, before all worlds. Uh, and that is a phrase that occurs very early. Greek uh, in the early fathers. Section 7. Therefore, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, being united with him, either by himself or by the apostles, so neither do ye anything without the bishop and the presbyters. He emphasizes over and over and over the necessity of bishops, presbyters, and his priests and deacons. Um, and he talks about you need to be one, one prayer, one supplication, one mind, or there's a unity. And he talks about one altar, even to Jesus Christ. And once again, he uses the word altar uh, for the sacrifice uh, of the Eucharist. Um, in section 9, he says, If then those who had walked in ancient practices attained unto newness of hope, no longer observing Sabbaths, but fashioning their lives after the Lord's day, on which our life also arose in heaven and through his death. And he goes on. He's mentioning the Lord's day, uh, which in, in uh, Latin is Dominica. Uh, the Lord's Day, the Dominus, and it's a Sunday. And here he's, he's referencing uh, St. Paul's letters about how the Levitical regulations are suspended, that the Sabbath has now been transferred to, to the Lord's Day for Christians, uh, to Sunday. Uh, and he, and he's, so he, here, he, very early on, we have a mention of Sunday as an important day. Um, in paragraph 10, he, he talks about I circle this. He talks about let us learn to live as beseemeth Christianity. Uh, in Greek, it's ho Christia, Christian, he, ho Christianismos, ho Christianismos, and this is the earliest extant use that we have of the word Christianity. Uh, in, in this, uh, there's no other ancient document that has been preserved that has this word that's earlier than this. In section 11. He says, Be ye fully persuaded concerning the birth and passion of the resurrection, which took place in the time of the governorship of Pontius Pilate. For these things were truly and certainly done by Jesus Christ our hope. And here we have a reference to Pontius Pilate, and this is a little bit of an early creed, and I'll talk about Pilate in, in a moment. Um, but he talks about the passion, and the passion is, is uh, we talked about this before, it comes from the Latin word patior, passus, it means suffering. Uh, and, and, and he's talking about the suffering of our Lord. In section 13, towards the end, he says, uh, in the end, with the, walk in the end with your reverend bishop and with the fitly wreathed spiritual circlet of your presbytery and with the deacons who walk after God. Be obedient to the bishop and to one another. And once again, he has the three words. And he, he, he closes by sending greetings and polycarp. The next letter, and the last letter we'll do today, is to the Trallians. There's a town called Trallus in Asia, uh, which also sent delegates to Smyrna to meet with Ignatius. And he refers to Polybius, your bishop, who visited me in Smyrna in my bonds. Uh, in section two, he says, it is therefore necessary, even as your want is, that ye should do nothing without the bishop, but be obedient also to the presbytery, as to the apostles, apostles of Jesus Christ our hope. And again, the importance of bishops. We come to this, an even stronger statement of this in section 3. This is a very famous statement. He says, In like manner, let all men respect the deacons as Jesus Christ, even as they should respect the bishop as being a type of the Father, and the presbyters as the council of God and as the college of apostles. Apart from these, there is not even the name of a church. This is the strongest statement yet that to have a church, you have to have these bishops and presbyters and deacons in the apostolic succession. Um, and the, the three orders, without these, there's not even the name of a church. And of course, in the Protestant Reformation, uh, there were a number of Protestants that said, you don't need bishops, you don't even need priests, and that the, the, the presbyters are just really elders, and there's no real sacrifice, no real presence. And of course, the Epistles of Ignatius stand as a direct refutation of this. Uh, whatever you think of the theology, uh, 
it is not accurate to say that it that the Reformation theology in that regard is attempting to recover something that the early church actually believed, because it did, and, and Ignatius shows that's the case. Um, let's continue on with the Tertullians. Um, in section five, he says, I am in bonds and can comprehend heavenly things and the arrays of the angels and the mutterings of the principalities, things visible and things invisible. And of course, that's right from our creed about things visible and invisible. It echoes uh, uh, Colossians 1.16, you look that up. Um, and then we have a very explicit creed in section nine. He says, be deaf therefore, when any man speaketh to you apart from Jesus Christ, who was of the race of David, man, who was the son of man, Mary, man, who was truly born, man, and ate and drank, man, and was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died in the sight of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, who moreover was truly raised from the dead, his father having raised him, who in the like fashion will so raise us also who believe on him. His father, I say, will raise us in Christ Jesus, apart from whom we have not true life. This is an early creed, and uh, there are several features that are, that are, that are interesting here. Um, one is the reference to persecuted under Pontius Pilate. Uh, and it's interesting about Pontius Pilate. Among the pagans, his name has said, has been said more times than any other name of any other pagan. Uh, the name Pontius Pilate has been uttered every Sunday in every church in the world for thousands of years, uh, we say the name Pontius Pilate. And people uh, may, might ask, why do we say Pontius Pilate the Creed? Why is it so important that he put in there? And there's some speculation, well, maybe it's because he did just, he was just a terrible man, we want to heap, uh, heap scorn upon him for having uh, sons of uh, Christ to death. That's not really the reason. The reason Pontius Pilate is in there has to do with, with Dayton. Um, and if you look at fairy tales, uh, how, do, how do fairy tales start? You, every fairy tale you'll hear, they'll say, once upon a time. And when you hear once upon a time, you know that what you're about to hear is not a historical story that happened at some time. It's a fairy tale. Once upon a time, it didn't happen at any particular time. It's going to be an interesting story that, that may that catch your imagination. It's not a historical event. The reason we say he was persecuted under Pontius Pilate, and we say uh, Crucifixus etiam pro nobis Sufoncio Pilato, who was crucified also for us in the Pontius Pilate, is the statement of our belief that this actually happened in history, that he, he there really was, he, the incarnation happened, and the crucifixion actually happened at a particular time, in a particular place, under, with particular people. And that's why that's said there. And it's, it's another emphasis that Ignatius is saying, he's saying this really happened. Uh, you can look it up. Pontius Pilate was prefect in Judea. Now, you know, it, it is very odd. Uh, Pontius Pilate, if you, if you told him, your name is gonna be said every Sunday for thousands of years, he'd probably have been reacting with great, great amazement. Uh, and maybe said, well, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. And of course, it's not so cool because of the reason it's, it's said. Uh, and Pontius Pilate's interesting, in, in the Coptic church, there, there are legends about Pontius Pilate later. Uh, none of these are historical. Uh, but there is a legend that he, he converted and was martyred. And in the Coptic church, I'm told, that it, to this day, he's, there's a martyrdom of Pilate, and he's viewed as a martyr, uh, which is an interesting thing. Hope it happened. That might be, might be uh, good. But his name is in here uh, for a historical date. Section 10. This, section 10 is, is, is dealing with what's called the docetist heresy. It says, but if it were as certain persons who are godless, that is, unbelievers say, that he suffered only in semblance, being themselves mere semblance, why am I in bonds? And why also do I desire to fight with wild beasts? So I die in vain. Truly then I lie against the Lord. The early docetist heresy came up. The docet docetism has to do with the Greek word it means to, to seem, to symbol. And a lot of people said, well, you know, Jesus is God. And God can't suffer. Uh, he, God. He doesn't suffer. And therefore, since we believe and affirm that Jesus is God, how do we, how was he crucified? Was he really suffering? And they, they would say, no, we just seem to suffer. Because of course he can't suffer. It's a great mystery. And these pious people trying to explain this thing. And, they, and they, their belief is called docetism. And the early 
uh, uh, Christians and the early bishops, Andre Ignatius, say, no, that's not true. Uh, he's true God, true man. He truly suffered. He didn't seem, seem to suffer. It's a great mystery, the two natures, that, that you can be God and man at the same time, that you can be impassable, not suffering, and passable, suffering. But it's the core of the message. It's not something that they thought, that these people thought up as a philosophy. It was the message they got from the apostles and the people who were there at Calvary said, you know, I was there and it was suffering. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't it wasn't similar. And he says says if, if, if you know if, he, if they say he suffered only in symbols, why am I in bonds? What what am I doing here? Um, so it's a very strong personal reputation of an early heresy, which underlies a, an insistence that the message, the core message, must be preserved. They were not going to pervert it by saying, oh, well, he was God, and therefore all this suffering was just in semblance, and that makes us feel better about Calvary. No, he's saying the message, I'm sorry, whether you like it or not, that's the message. And that's what's being passed on in the apostolic succession. Um, the end of this letter, he, uh, he ends by, uh, again, saying, submit yourself to your bishop, and he sends greetings. And that's the end of the letter of the Trallians. Uh, the next session, Ignatius Part 2, will we'll take up the remaining letters starting with the Epistle to the Romans. Uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, why don't we close the prayer? Yeah, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for, for sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Father, Son,